How's it going everybody? My name is Christopher, this is my dad Leighton, and this is the Ustazen Show, and today we're talking about some more frequently asked questions that we get all the time here at Partners Dog Training School. Uh, but before we get into that, a real quick word from our sponsors. So we're talking about um, Partners Dog Training. Partners Dog Training is our main sponsor, of course, and they help us put all this together and provide all the equipment and the bandwidth. And uh, we're really proud of our school. We've got some great uh, expansion going on right now. We're about three quarters of the way through our paving project that we should have that up and running here within the next week or so. Yep, and some other really exciting things going on with uh, daycare and the dock should be up here anytime soon for swim yeah, training we were and so forth. Checking, which be really we were cool. testing the dock yesterday actually. Yeah. Crush, uh, crush my Belgian, I'm sorry, my Dutch Shepherd got his first few jumps last night and he was ecstatic. He couldn't believe it when he, uh, when he showed up at the dock with me and he was able to jump. Yep. Uh, and then if you aren't in Arizona and you can't come see us yourself, check out Hey Ludwig on Facebook Messenger. Basically, we took our experience, put it inside a little messenger bot that you could tell about your dog, and it creates personalized curriculums based on uh, those behavioral traits to help you with problems, tricks, and um, obedience things all, all along the line. So, um, which brings us to our uh, kind of topic for the day, which is frequently asked questions that we get all the time here at the school, as well as just some basic uh, frequently asked questions that we get from a behavioral standpoint, um, being a, a dog training school. So I know you put on your Facebook page, your personal Facebook page today, um, yes. asking some questions <clears throat> from some people, and we'll probably get to those here in a few seconds, but is there anything that you want to you know, mention no, I, uh, I just want to welcome, we've got Travis joining us tonight and Mary's here as she always is, Luella's here as she always is. Yep. Uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, checking in with us. Travis, we're going to be talking about your dog here in a, in a second. Um, and then Eddie Garcia today was also, wow, it's all, the, it's all my shooting or all our shooting friends tonight. But uh, Eddie Garcia was talking today about his new puppy. He sends me videos of his new puppy that he hasn't got yet. And he was asking me some questions and, and I'm actually going to talk about that here in a second. So if you guys are online, make sure that you uh, go to our Facebook page, either my personal page, which I'm watching, as well as the partners page and send us your questions if you have anything and uh, we'll try and get to that. Yep, and so we just uh, finished up a holiday weekend here at Partners at Memorial Day weekend. We had, I think, 25 dogs going home on Tuesday. Wow. Um, the day after Crazy Memorial Day, weekend. we had about 60 dogs in the kennels overnight. Um, and so, which kind of brings me to our first topic that we're talking about today, which is what we get asked all the time, is there staff here on holidays? So we always have people on the property, uh, Christopher and myself and Sarah, uh, actually live on the property. My dad also lives on the property. Uh, we try and always schedule things around so that there's always one or more of us here at the same time. Um, as far as staff are concerned and being in the kennels, we don't allow people in the kennels at night time because it's disruptive to the dogs. So uh, generally around six, seven o'clock in the evening, the last staff sort of pack up. They have classes going on outside until about eight o'clock. They'll do a walk around the kennels uh, here at about 6.30, 7, 7.30, depending on what's happening with their classes. And then, uh, and then they're basically out of there uh, we do have alarm systems and monitoring systems so we can keep an eye I actually was watching the uh, the AC system today uh, we had our AC people coming and doing the annual check of our facility and uh, making sure that everything's running right and uh, so we monitor that as well and then our staff come in normally around six o'clock in the morning the first people come in and the trainers come in at about seven yeah we always say it's the nice thing about or maybe the not so nice thing about being in the, the pet industry is when everyone else goes out of town that means we're working overtime and, and extra time to uh, make sure to care for all of their animals while they're gone. Um, which kind of brings me, you kind of mentioned uh, in terms of not having staff in the kennels overnight. Uh, so that's a, a big question that we get. A lot of people ask us, can you do potty training for our dog? And usually what we say is we can't do a full potty training program, um, but we can definitely you know, implement a lot of crate training, a lot of structure, and obviously a lot of strategy and, and coordination with you as the pet parent to make sure that your dog can go home and be potty trained effectively. Um, so even though we don't have someone being able to take a dog out at night, which would be required if you really were doing a full-fledged potty training program, um, that's still something that we're able to at least offer part of the way uh, for people that are needing help with their puppies and, and so forth along those lines. Yeah. Um, we we tried it. We tried having people here overnight uh, before, but it was incredibly disruptive. As I said earlier, uh, the dogs bark all the time. You can't walk into the kennels at nighttime without setting off, mm. you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 dogs, depending on how many dogs are in, 
in the kennels and training at a time and so uh, that was that was probably six seven eight years ago that we had somebody staying overnight um, and we since changed that um, we have an alarm system as i said that monitors everything we have cameras everywhere etc so uh, but the but the potty training is a problem um, you know we can't obviously take dogs out to go potty at night so if you're potty training your dog this is something that you're going to have to do because there are certain schedules and and i'll turn it you want me to touch on that for a little bit is that what you're kind of getting at no i mean i was just basically saying because we get that as a question a lot is can you help potty train my dog and like i said usually sure. we say not quite but yeah. we can definitely help you like it's not unheard of for a dog to leave here potty trained but we don't guarantee we don't really right. guarantee any animal behavior, but definitely, you know, something along those lines yep. would be pretty difficult. So let's, let's talk about potty training just really quickly, because that is something that comes up quite often. And Eddie was actually talking about that today with his new puppy. So the first thing you've got to remember about potty training is that it's a schedule based activity. So, so the best way I always tell people, you can try it out, kind of see if it just works for you. If it does work, you're fine. If it doesn't work, you start having issues. We call it elimination issues. Then you've got to go back to schedule. The best way to do this is as follows. So this is how you I would do it if you're having problems or if you want to avoid problems first thing is start writing everything down have literally a, a, a pad a clip pad or a or yep. something like that and write down okay uh, 5 45 a.m took dog out went potty etc seven o'clock did this eight o'clock did that put in there the time that you feed your dog put in there the time that you take them out of the crate to go exercise the time you put them back in and what you'll find over a period of four or five six days is that you'll see that your puppy will actually work to a schedule the second thing you want to remember is that any time that your puppy comes out of its kennel or gets off its bed or comes you know, out of a sleep environment, it has to go potty immediately, as soon as possible. And in actual fact, with young puppies, we recommend you pick the puppy up, you carry it outside, you put it down where you want them to go potty, and then you tell them to go potty. If necessary, put them on a leash, take them out, hold them in that area. Don't let them go to other areas. Don't walk them out to that area, because if they go pee on the way there, then you've just screwed up your own patterning. So everything is about establishing that pattern or that protocol, right? The third thing that you've got to remember is that when a puppy does have an accident, it's just that. It's an accident. Don't beat up on the dog. Don't stick their face in it. Don't beat them. Don't smack. Don't yell. Nothing like that. With a puppy, none of that stuff works. What you do is you create a negative environment for the puppy. In other words, he associates you with negative and then you'll never teach him to potty train. Yep. So those are the three things you've got to remember. If you have more issues than that, you've got to talk to us in a little bit more detail and it, it does get quite complicated. Okay. And just talking about protocols here real quick, um, a lot of times people ask why they're not able to go like into the kennels where the dogs are and where they're all sleeping. Right. Um, what would be, because I know so what we So great question. We, we don't, I don't want people in the kennels at all. We have a glass door, you have a window, you can look through, we'll open the door, let you look inside. And the reason why we don't want people in the kennels is because I don't know where you have been. And you might have been in an environment, you might have been at PetSmart, you, where, I shouldn't say PetSmart, it has nothing to do with PetSmart, but in an environment where there are a lot of dogs present. So it could be a dog park, PetSmart, you know, a place like Home Depot, Lowe's, man, every time I go to Lowe's or Home Depot now, there's at least four or five dogs walking around. Why pretty is well that? Be that's, that's I think always like a That's kind of developed place. a reputation that you can take your dog there. And, and to be honest, all the dogs I've seen there in the last few weeks, I haven't seen a single dog misbehave. They're actually being very well behaved, which is yeah. really cool to see. And I like that. I think it's good socialization for your dogs, etc. So the reason why we don't want you in the kennels is because I don't know or you don't know where you have been. And if you have come across something, any kind of contaminant, any kind of bacteria, any kind of in, anything like that that you could bring into the kennel, the one we always worried about, and I'm scared to even say it, I don't even like to talk about it, is parvo or distemper, right? That's a catastrophic issue for us. So we don't want people in the kennels. Our staff, they're more in a controlled environment. Uh, whenever we're a little nervous, we'll have a foot bath. The people, have, the trainers have to step through it when they go in and out of the kennel area. It just helps us contain that safety. Now, this is actually a really good discussion. And Eddie, if you're watching, this is the same thing I was talking to you about literally 45 minutes ago. When you get a newborn puppy, do not take that puppy out into the environments like dog parks and pet smarts and, and, and places. That's not the time to be showing off your puppy. What, basically, what you want to do is you want to keep them at your home. You know, if you want to do socialization, that's fine. Maybe a little walk in the street, that's fine. But don't let them be around a whole bunch of other dogs because the immune system has not yet been established sufficiently for them to be around other dogs. And so what you're doing is you're risking your dogs, you're risking their health, but you're also risking their lives. A, an adult dog has a much stronger 
immune system and so because of that if they come in contact with something like a coccidia or a or some kind of a virus or something like that their immune system helps fight that off more effectively whereas a puppy does not have that ability so if you have newborn puppies anything up to 18 19 eh, 16 18 19 weeks of age thereabouts it's actually based on their vaccinations and so on we don't want them into an environment like that so while we're talking about vaccinations typically what happens is that someone comes to us around that 20 week period when they're dogs about five months and starting to develop some you know small behavioral issues and, and want to get training um, and typically that means that they would have just recently got their last round of vaccinations and sometimes that happens where it's literally the day before they want to start training and we actually have a seven day incubation period after a dog has their last uh, vaccination before we'll let them come into the school uh, right. so why is that so technically this whole period of how long many days we've always said seven days that's kind of a rule that i made up based on just the information that i've always had it, it could be as little as four or five days there are times we'll make exceptions 48 hours I've um, heard for and older it, dogs yeah and and you know it depends also on when the dog so if you've had a dog that's been vaccinated before then it's not like that vaccination has like a one year time lapse on it then exactly 365 days after it was vaccinated boom all of a sudden it's no longer vaccinated you know there's a crossover period and a lot of people actually believe that period might be as much as maybe six months to maybe even a year um, you'll hear people talk about we're over vaccinating our dogs because we're doing it on an annual basis there's some vaccinations you do on a three three year basis as well um, but the bottom line is that if you have a dog that's already had a vaccination before or multiple vaccinations then there's a good chance that that period is not that significant the problem for us as a kennel the problem for you as a new puppy owner is that you don't know what those details are same thing people that self-vaccinate their dogs it's perfectly fine I've self vaccinated my dogs oh my gosh my entire life probably but the problem with the kennel is I don't know when that was given so we kind of trusting that a vet has done it and that the vet did it correctly there's another thing as well when you vaccinate a dog if you don't do that vaccination properly and you maybe don't get all the vaccine into the dog maybe you do it subcutaneously which is <clears throat> excuse me which is where you do it under the skin layer but you pull the, the needle out too soon or there's pressure or if you hit something underneath and you don't get it all in then actually you haven't given the full vaccine you know i can spend an hour probably talking about this because there's also a discussion going on as to why we have to vaccinate the same quantity in milliliters of vaccine for a large dog as a small dog uh, but i'm not going to get into all that i'm not a vet and i'm not professed to know these things and the truth is a lot of these vaccinations is kind of like a crapshoot as well we do the vaccination we think it's the best protocol that sometimes they don't well, work it's, it's just like getting like the flu or the cold sure uh, we've talked vaccine, about this before so, right yeah. portatella kennel cough same thing you can still, um, still but for us it. as a school as a protocol we set it to a week after they've had their shots and and uh, that's just more of a safety thing and if you have a vet that has a different opinion about that that's fine get them to write a little note and send it to us and then we'll consider that so obviously vets have more knowledge in this than, than we do and, and while we're talking about incubation periods again a lot of the times what we see is that someone will pick a dog up from like a shelter or rescue type environment Environment. Right. And because again, that dog likely has some sort of behavioral issues, um, then they want to get training. That's why for it's the in dog. a shelter. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, most likely. And so, so they want to get training for the dog, and they want to bring it in. But we actually have a 30-day incubation period after a dog leaves a shelter, right. after they leave a rescue-type environment, and, before they're able to the come here to the school. And the reason for that is because there's a strong—I well, shouldn't say strong. There's a possibility that they could have been exposed to something like distemper. The distemper is fatal in dogs. So if a dog's been exposed, it's up to 30 days after that that the dog could still be considered contagious. And so we just don't play, take any chances. We don't want any dogs coming in that could put, potentially put us, meaning us, our dogs at risk. And so it's just safer to say 30 days. So if you do adopt a dog, make sure that you keep that dog in a, in a secure environment. I don't want to say quarantine, but certainly in a, in a controlled environment so that if something shows up a week or so after you adopted the dog, that you can get the dog to a vet and you haven't exposed your other pets to it. Now, I know when I say that, I'm going to have a bunch of people that bring a new dog home from adopting a dog or go get another dog at a shelter, which I absolutely encourage you to do. And they bring the dog home and within five minutes, the dog is around their other dogs. Well, that's a chance you take and you'll be fine. Most of the time but it's those it's those one out of ten one out of 50 times that we worried about yep. let's talk about some of the um 
well, more I, happy things. Yeah. It's just like we're in a serious, heavy game right? stuff. I know. Well, I mean, a lot of it's really good information for people. Um, one real quick thing, since again, we're talking about shelter and rescue and, and so forth. Um, a lot of the time we get a question if, again, if a dog has a bite history, has behavioral issues on what happens if we get bit here at the school. Um, and to be honest, it's kind of just a, a fortune of the trade. Um, it's something that you, you know, basically sign up for when you choose to work with behavioral type uh, aggression and rehabilitation type cases uh, with dogs. So if we get bit, it's on us. We have insurance and so forth that covers that for, for us and we have protocols in place to make sure um, or to at least hope that it doesn't happen again. Uh, but your dog will not be sent to a shelter, wouldn't be sent to you know animal control because they bit us, obviously. Yeah, we do have to report it. Yeah. Uh, that's Especially a state requirement. Um, well, that's their story. But th th you have to report it. Uh, the argument is that if the dog has got rabies, that they want to know about it, so therefore that they can um, they can check to see that the dog is not rabid. Um, I don't believe we've had a rabies case in our county in, yeah. I don't know, 15 years or something yeah, like that. Uh, so it's unlikely. That. So really, it's more of a state requirement. You have to report the bite. If you have medical treatment done by a doctor or by a hospital or whatever, they have to report the bite. Um, but, you know, we, we deal with this all the time. We try not to get bitten. We work really hard not to. We train our staff not to. I joke with them all the time. If you get bitten, then I'm going to be watching you and paying more attention to why you got bitten. Um, because there are some cases that uh, we're working with that... Um, that involve a lot of aggression in dogs and so forth. But um, it doesn't affect our training. We still work with the dogs. It doesn't stop us from training a dog. We still uh, we still care about the dog as much. So uh, switching kind of paces a bit, uh, it's starting to heat up now. Obviously, we said yep. in the beginning, um, we were opening up our, our pool here pretty shortly for, for boarding and daycare and so forth type dogs. Um, and along with that, obviously, as it gets hotter, there's more heat on the ground and, and right. I think the the other day we had a, a hiking um, fatality. No, not a fatality, but a um, a ban on basically yeah. dogs being. So outside. Phoenix has a law um, that if the temperature reaches 100 degrees, you may not take your dog out in public onto a trail and walk the dog, or you will be cited for uh, for. Um, it's not, uh, is it not animal, animal abuse? abuse. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's animal abuse, something like that. Um, I actually think it's a great idea. When the temperatures yeah. get to that sort of level outside, you really do have to, t to, to pay attention to that. Uh, Mary brought up a really good question. She's talking about paw protection during the summer. Yeah. Uh, really easy way. I've been teaching this for years. Take your hand, put it down the ground. If you can keep your hand on the ground, you're good to go. If you can't keep your hand down there because it's too hot, your dog shouldn't be outside. And yes, dogs can burn their paws fairly severely. Um, they're not designed, most of our dogs are not designed to be outside. I know in the old days dogs used to run around outside in 120 degrees, but that's not like they are now. And so uh, when we were in the army or in, uh, in working with law enforcement and military dogs, uh, we would literally harden our dog's paws with, uh, with something, um, I forget what it was called, um, it was some kind of a not a meth methylate spirits, I think it was called methylate spirits, nothing to do with meth or drugs, something else. And it would, what it would do is harden their pads and make them a little more durable. Um, I haven't seen anybody do that forever. Now they wear little booties, and even the booties you got to be careful of. So I was going to say, just keep what happens if you were on a trail and your dog has those booties on, would you still be cited in that case? Yeah, probably you would, because the law doesn't say if you're wearing booties or not. It's one of those things where they say you shouldn't have your dog on the trail, so chances are, and chances are you're going to have a hundred people on the trail telling you you shouldn't have your dog on the trail. It's the same thing with having your dog in Side of a vehicle during summer it's yeah. not allowed it's illegal doesn't matter if you have the aircon, aircon on running air conditioning etc the only way you can get away from that is if you have an rv and your dog is inside the rv because that doesn't apply to the law but um for that you can't i want to talk about a question travis brought up travis yep. uh, emailed me a little bit earlier or messaged me a little bit earlier tonight travis a good friend of ours from uh, the shooting world he and his family wonderful people mike gibson uh, Travis, his wife, etc. And he came up with a, he asked me, when is the right time to kind of say goodbye to your, your pets, you know? Um, and, and he specifically said, you know, some days, um, I always get really sad when I talk about these things, but you know, when, when you have a situation, and I've been through it many, many times, I've had clients go through it, I've had friends go through it, where your dog does really well for, for a while, and then all of a sudden they kind of drop off and they're really struggling or they're in pain, and then they get stronger and fitter. There's even this theory out there that just before your dog passes away, they'll actually get better and appear to be a lot better, a lot healthier, and that's kind of their way of saying goodbye. Um, I've seen that many times in my life, uh, so I can't tell you, uh, you know, what we were talking about the other day, I don't have evidence, I don't have, uh, what's that word? It's anecdotal. I don't have anecdotal, anecdotal no, you evidence. you do have anecdotal evidence, you don't have quantifying that evidence. 
happens. Well, I don't have proof about this, but I know yeah. for a fact that it does. It definitely does happen. I've seen it many times. The way I look at this thing is, and what I explained to Travis is that I look at the dog's quality of life. So if you have a dog and a pet that you've had for many, many years, and you, you've had a really good life with the dog, and they start struggling, and they have one good day, and then a bad day, and then a couple of good days, and a couple of bad days, I kind of look at it as being, you know, that's that time. Um, you know, we as pet owners don't want to give up. We, we want to have that companion around. That companion has been a part of our lives. Many of us travel quite extensively and the dogs travel with us. Uh, Travis, I think, is one of those people. And so it's really tough when you guys say goodbye, but you've got to look at the dog's quality of life. And if they, you know, if they are in pain, if they are struggling, that is the time for you to step up and to, to take that tough decision. The other thing to remember is that dogs have a very high pain threshold. So what that means is that they don't show pain very much. It's actually incredible to see dogs that have been injured, dogs that have been shot in, in law enforcement and in military, um, even dogs that have got into fights. You know, they get into a fight and they beat the heck out of each other and then they come back and they, they're still operating pretty efficiently even though they've got substantial wounds and so forth. So Is, it, they're, they're is there pain. adrenaline for dogs? Like, do yeah, dogs there adrenaline? is. Um, you know, they, they get keyed up. We call it getting in a zone. You know, dogs get into a fight. It's very difficult to control them. And in actual fact, I have another question I'm going to answer here in a few minutes about that. But, you know, for, uh, for us, Travis, you know, when you reach that point where you just don't think the dog is generally happy or if they're having a couple of setbacks, then I think it's time. And even if you feel that, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's on a good day, well, that's okay. Then end it on a good day, have the good memories. And I'm a big person for that. I try and remember the good things. I try and remember that last 24, 48 hours. In fact, if, better, if anything, I try and delete that, that bad, tough side, difficult side, painful side from my mind. But, you know, as we've talked about before, everybody processes it differently and you're entitled to process it the way you want. Um, nobody can tell you, you know, how to feel, not to feel. Um, and, and as I said earlier on, you know, despite the fact I've been through this many times, um, you know, we do what we do because we Never love animals and, and we're passionate about them and, and we enjoy the time they give us and the time they spend with us. And, and then we, uh, we remember those good times. So I hope that helps you, Travis, and I hope that uh, makes your decision a lot and, easier. And was it, it was two weeks ago we did an episode specifically on um, yeah. the passing of a dog. So go ahead and check that out. Uh, I think it was episode 13. Um, but yeah, or maybe 14. So you had a couple questions that you received today. What was uh, what was some of those that you wanted to talk about? Yes, that was the the one question. And then um, what was the, let me just see. The dog chasing it. after cats, prey drive. What, did they say cats? I think it was a house cat, no? I didn't see that. I need to go back and look for that. But I'll tell you what one question, oh, you know what the one question was yep. that we got was. Um, chasing after wife's cats. Chasing after your wife's cats. Yeah, don't let the dog hit your wife's cat. Where is that one? Uh, uh, Chris Causal. Chris Causal. Yep. Okay. So what's the most effective way to stop your dog from chasing your wife's house cats? Ask you for a friend. Sure you are. So basically there's two ways. And in actual fact, I'm going to tie this together with Jessie's question because Jessie Stockton had a, a question as well. Let me read you hers. She said, how do you recall, how do you teach recall to a dog that has a strong prey drive and can fit through very small spaces? So we're actually talking about the same situation. If you have a dog that has got a very high drive, chase drive, prey drive, technically it's all chase drive. So even if they, if your dog has prey drive, unless they're actually hunting something with the intention of eating it, it becomes more of a chase drive. So if your dog has a very high chase drive, you need to increase the amount of control that you have on the dog and build a stronger foundation. Now, having said that, let me just tell you right out here that if you have a very high drive dog, the dog is really keyed up, like the Belgian Mals, the Dutch Shepherds, if you watch them on TV or if you watch them in, in on Facebook or whatever, you'll see that they're the ones that are jumping these crazy walls, blasting through doors, etc. Well, any of these very high drive dogs, it's almost impossible to control them when they're in a very heightened sense of uh, excitement and they have they've built up this energy. So the way we control it is we build foundation. Um, you got to do heel work training, heel, sit down, stay, teaching them foundation, teaching them how to behave, how to pay attention to you. We use food reward based training to establish that. So this is kind of like you're doing your homework prior to the situation occurring. Now, in the case of the cats, like what Chris was talking about, um, I would literally do that training around where the cats are around the house. Because what that'll do is it'll teach your dog like, hey, you are in charge, your wife is in charge, and that it's not a place for them to chase the animals. The more control you put into that environment, the more control you'll have even when the cats are around. The next thing you've got to do is you've got to try and limit 
the amount of mistakes. Now, mistakes would be when something goes wrong, right? You want to limit the amount of times that that goes wrong. So today there was a client that was training with us and we were busy doing all the paving and uh, the client and, and one of our instructors, uh, Melissa, came out and they were doing some training with their dog around where we were working with hammers and making a noise and digging and everything like that. And the dog in the beginning was really stressed out. And I explained to the client that you need to put more foundation into the dog, more, you gotta, you gotta manage the dog, micromanage everything that the dog does. We start off with doing heel, getting the dog into sit position. Sit means pay attention, sit next to me, look at me. It's kind of like you would say with a child sitting in a chair or in a classroom where the teacher says to the kids, okay kids, all sit down, take your seats. What she's really doing is she's establishing control over that environment. Now once you've got that, then you can start adding in your distractions. So in Chris's case, it would be the cats. In uh, Jesse's case, it would be that, that area where your dog wants to escape to, right? You're going to do it on leash at first. You're going to work the dog, do heel work, heel sit, heel sit, heel sit, sit down, heel sit down, that type of thing, over and over and over until you get a pattern established in your dog's mind of listening to you amongst that high, excitable type environment. Mm -hmm. um, once you've got that, then you're going to go to the next step. Uh, there are a couple of things you can do for the next step. You can use a long leash where you go along and Jesse, you would have long lines uh, because you're because of horse riding. Uh, so the same long line that you use to lunge your horse, you clip that onto your dog and you start working them from 15, 20, 25 feet away from you. You teach your dog come back, you put pressure on the leash, meaning you pull on the leash and by that stage the dog comes back. Now, if you've got to drag the dog back, your foundation is not strong enough. You've got to go back to building foundation again. So you're going to go back, do your heel work, pull your dog back to heel and bring them back into the heel position. Once you've done that half a dozen times over, over you know, a day, half a dozen times a day, over a period of a week or two, then you should start having control and you can actually start dropping that leash, letting it drag on the ground. I'm talking about the long leash, the 30 foot long leash, and uh, get to the point of, of basically using your voice to control the dog. Don't try and use voice in the beginning on its own because it won't work. Go back to the leash. If you have a kind of a setback, then you have to go back on your leash again. And I know, Jesse, from you guys' house, I'm assuming you're talking about your house in, in Dallas. Um, you know, there you've got a garden, you've got the golf course out there. You've got plenty of that little grassy area. Work the dog in that area. And for Chris, you're going to work the dog in your family room with the cats. And, and one tip for working around the cats or working in prey drive situations is to maybe put the cat in the crate. Um, and that will be like your starting point in terms of working through yeah. that type of prey drive. Because then you don't have to worry about the cat running past the dog or the dog actually getting to the cat. But you can still address those, um, those situations effectively. And uh, yeah, so one really interesting question that Brooke came up with is she adopted her puppy and the puppy is blind but can see shadows and the puppy's also deaf. Um, it's a learning curve, but right now she's going to grab, she grabs at everything that she can get and she's worried about her grabbing something like a wire or right. that's something that she can get hurt on and how can they prevent that? So whenever you work with a, a dog or a puppy that has and, got some physical disabilities. And, and Jen mentioned here, if she does actually truly see shadows, hand motion and touch training. Absolutely. Food. And for those of you who don't know, Jen Schelt is one of our senior instructors and she also works in the office. She's on our, on our sales and our on our. Uh, office side as well so very experienced instructor so feel free to write and Jen can answer it uh, as well online as, as well training, yep. yep so just in a nutshell the, the the whole challenge with training handicapped dogs meaning dogs with blindness or deafness or whatever and and we've trained literally hundreds of dogs like that is you got to find the little things that tick with them right and generally what I always do is I try and find a way to get touch right um, the best way to get touch is using food get the dog to pay attention to you as they touch your hand you give them a little food, tiny treat. You, just don't, you don't want to feed them. In other words, you're not reaching saturation. You want to do a little bit at a time, and that builds up that thing of finding you. Then start working a little bit further away from the dog. So you call the dog to you. If you have to, you put a leash on the dog or a thin little line, that, like a, we call it a trap line, uh, just a, like a parachute cord, where you're just have, giving them a little tiny tug, but a leash will work just fine. And then when the dog comes to you, he gets his little reward. You should see ways because when dogs are deaf, when they're blind, they build up a kind of a, like another sense where they're able to function and do things using their other senses, right? Um, when you now, I think you mentioned if I just pull that back up again, she mentioned something about the dog grabs at stuff. Wire like grabs wiring. at wiring. You know, dogs dogs have a a common sense of of survival. So if it's something that they find distasteful, they probably won't grab it too often. If it's an electrical wire, well, that could happen. I mean, some dogs do do that. It all depends. And one of the things I'm always careful about when I start talking about these is that, you know, there's this and then there's that. 
you know we had a, a shepherd in the kennels here a couple of days ago that was just intense on destroying itself so it would slam up against the kennel we have a special kennel we keep it in and it does fine in that kennel but the moment it goes outside into the play runs or whatever it, it's intent on hurting itself well that's not a that's not a common situation so i'm always worried i might be talking about something that's more of an a, of an individual or an extreme thing and i don't mean extreme in a judgmental way i just mean it's a little more of a challenge to work with now one of the things about uh, deaf dogs and jen actually mentioned that is that when a dog is deaf they're still watching you very carefully so you can do hand signals so you develop a hand signal and then there's all sorts of variations of that you know hands would become where you kind of sweep your hand towards you um, sometimes we'll do a come where we'll kind of sweep it over I don't want to hit my microphone but sweep it like over our shoulders and the reason why we do it over our shoulder or just like a high thing like that is so the dog can actually see the silhouette because if you're doing it towards you then your hand is framed by your body and the dog doesn't see your hand in front of the body uh, same thing if we do it down we hold the hand up in the air like that that's a down signal dogs see that at a distance and they can learn to do that uh, you could do a clap even though the dog can't hear a lot of times that means pay attention to me it could also mean good dog you know like this they see that movement and the clap is something that comes easily to us so you've got to develop this little language that works between you and your dog and um, yeah it's, it's not really a lot of detail i've given you now but it's a starting point and hopefully that works and you know check in with us in the weekend's time and let us know how that goes well and, and um, jen also mentioned like e-collar training in terms of creating a negative association to something that your dog yep. might be grabbing at so if it's um, a count, just it's electrical sure wire do, yeah well, like and, and just make sure to do enough training with the e-collar and i know uh we actually had another question here which might be able to be addressed with an e-collar as well um the licking the well yeah the licking is is one yeah so how do you teach your dog to to stop licking so i think i saw that with becca yes how do you yeah. see it? so licking again falls into the category is it just a, like a, a like a mild thing like licks at its paw um or is it, like or is it something like an ocd where they're intent on licking themselves you know creating a hot spot etc and obviously we're going to approach those two or things differently human out of like you know licking the human out yeah of Becca, if you're watching and i think you are watching give me a little more detail what are we talking about licking what licking you licking the self licking your paw uh, but while you're doing that i want to also mention whenever you get to licking the first thing you always want to do and that actually applies to a lot of these behavioral type things is make sure that your vet checks out because sometimes there's a there's like a transfer it's kind of like if you ever go and have acupuncture done, you hurt in your shoulder and the, the, the acupuncturist sticks a needle in your arm, that fixes your shoulder. It's kind of like a transfer in your body. So a lot of times dogs will lick some part of their body as a way of dealing with pain somewhere else. So you do want to make sure that a vet looks at your dog before we just kind of like start assuming it's a behavioral thing. But as far as lickings go, yes, you can stop licking. So it goes back to your foundation. It's the same as a child that sucks its thumb or a child that, uh, you know, plays its feet or picks at itself. You know, a lot of kids, um, I don't know what it is, but they'll st pick at their, their fingers like that. You used to have an OC. I'm trying to think what you had when you were a kid. But anyways, they develop that stuff. So what you got to do is you got to do you've got to use two different approaches right one is the punitive punishing approach where you do a mild correction not a hard correction uh, and the other is to divert your dog's attention distraction and takes it away from what they're doing now the first one the punishment one that only really works if you kind of if your dog understands what they're doing wrong so with a child you can say no don't pick your finger and the child you know don't scratch your finger don't uh, uh, you know bite your, nails, bite your fingernails bite your nails, any of those yeah. kind of things they understand what you're talking about with a dog it's got to be a timing based thing so the moment you see your dog like look over towards its paw let's say it's licking its paw then you'd be like ah and then when the dog looks up good so you basically interrupt that thought process of the dog wanting to do that okay and that works you can use an e-collar for it i don't really like using e-collars for something that's mild like it because your timing has got to be perfect and sometimes an e-collar is a little too extreme for that e-collars are great training tools if they are used correctly but you got to make sure that you know what you're doing number one number two get your timing right and number three make sure that it applies to that particular thing you're trying to fix Okay, let's talk serious OCD type licking, right? These are dogs that will lick a hot spot into themselves or basically lick themselves down to raw, they literally lick through their, their skin right down to raw meat. Those are much more serious issues and you need to look at some different things. Um, you definitely need to see your vet. Uh, it might be an idea to put the dog on some kind of a calming medication, sedative type medication, something like Clovicom or Paxil. I'm sorry, not Paxil. Um, uh, what's, uh, um, uh, now I'm brain dead, can't think yeah, of the other one. Yeah, I'll think of it you had a second. But anyway, you've got to talk to your Prozac. vet anyway. Prozac, thank you. Doggy Prozac, right? Uh, but because what you want to do is you kind of want to interrupt that thought mind process of the dog because obviously an extreme or a OCD type licking could be 
much more serious. Yep, and I think we'll try to get one last question. I got two. I got to get. Two got to get. So Linda, I'll answer your one real fast. When your dog had been gone for five months because of illness and is and he's coming back, will he remember me? His home routine, etc. His neighborhood. How do you control his rambunctious behavior when he's seeing you again? First question. Good news. They will remember. Um, we used to see that in the army. We would be gone for sometimes a year, six months, two years in some cases uh, from home and you'd return back home again and your dogs would recognize you instantly. There's lots of cases where dogs do that. Sometimes there's little, they're a little tentative uh, for the first few seconds or whatever. Don't stress about that. Just kind of be yourself and they'll revert right back again. Uh, how do you control the rambunctious? Well, if you haven't seen your dog for five months, I wouldn't worry about that too much in the beginning. I would just let him be playful and be all crazy and they'll settle down after a while okay just do something i need to read this thing real fast and understand what i'm talking about here uh yeah so quite a quick house working or house work i guess i don't know um if you guys want to check us out on spotify or itunes we're on there as well we're on youtube you can look up the uh, website link as well it's in the description here uh, i always get people that say they never realize that we're on spotify so you can listen to us during your drive time uh, again the links are right there in the description we try to do this Wednesdays at uh, 6 p.m. Right now it's Pacific Standard Time, so not Mountain Standard Time until we go into Daylight Savings again. Um, and I'm not sure what we're gonna be doing in a couple weeks here, because we're both gonna be traveling. So we might actually take a break. Um, let's see, this is our 15th. We'll have a, we'll have a show next episode. week. Yep. But the week after that, we're gonna be in Europe, so that might be tough to do. Yeah, that. we might, might just cap it at 16 episodes. Um, and that'll be our season one ending. So maybe we'll do something cool for our season So we'll finale. do one more episode next week. Yep, and then we'll take okay. probably a month or two break. That long of a break? Well, Holy I'm going to be gone, gonna for, let me, I'm gonna gonna be gone me for a month. Oh, we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll try and figure out how to run all the electronics. Okay, George, uh, Christopher is the brains behind this thing. Okay, George Riley. Um, I'm just going to read just the first part so you guys understand. She's got two German Shepherds. Her female is three and her male is two years old. We got them when they were all puppies and they've been very, they have very different personalities. They sent their female through puppy training, but she still won't listen to them. She's not friendly to anybody. Um, they won't listen to their commands. We cannot get them um, out of the window. Oh, they're barking everywhere. I think they're barking at the window. Um, and with her barking, my male joins in and it looks like she's going to fight him. So let me tell you a couple of things that are going on. First of all, you have a lot of stuff going on there in the house, right? Uh, you have multiple dogs. Uh, you have a lot of crazy behavior. You have a lot of, uh, I'm going to call it like a territorial drive. So territorially is the dogs are at the window. They're barking at something or nothing on the outside. There's two dogs side by side. They're working themselves up. There may be a third dog in the picture because you mentioned that your mom also has a, a one-year-old shepherd. Um, so the bottom line is you've got a lot of things going on and that does not make your life any easier. That makes it much more difficult. Um, I'm not sure when you say you sent your dog for training, whether they were training with us or whether they were training somewhere else, uh, but they still won't listen to you. That's an easy fix. The first thing you got to remember is if you send your dog for training, you still got to do the follow-up training, yeah. right? We'll sometimes get people and, and I mean, I can give you my $30,000 highly trained competition Belgian Malinois and he's not going to listen to you that, unless you learn how to work with that was that actually dog. one of the questions that I wanted to address and I was going to wait for probably next week. But, well, we can talk about um, that in more another, detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah another week. big question people the, say is like, why do I have to be a part of the training if right. I hired you to train my dog? So that's really easy. I can give you an analogy that explains it, but if you don't like the analogy, it's just one of those things. If you buy a car, you got to learn how to drive it. You don't have to learn how to build a car, put it all together, blah, blah. You just got to learn how to drive it. So it's the same with the dog. We can teach the foundation. I can make your dog. My staff can make your dog. I've got really good trainers and we often do that. We'll do that in a demo, show how the dog works and then it's up to you to learn how to do it that's why you got to attend classes or do follow-up training with your dog back to your questions here though um, so when you have multiple dogs in a high drive environment in this case territorial it's almost impossible to control them because they're feeding each other energy so you got to break that down into a much simpler thing that's the first thing I would recommend to you I would create your dogs uh, certainly two of the three and I'm just thinking there's three of them if I had read the the long uh, uh, post you made. Um, I would create two of them and I would start working on the third dog. Do some obedience training, walk them up to the window, make them stop and sit at the window, train that control into your dog, right? If your puppy went for training, there's a good chance that the training was done. Maybe it wasn't done enough or something. I don't know what the setup was, obviously, but the bottom line is that's what you're gonna start with. Once you've got that under control, you put that dog back in a crate, you get dog number two out, you do exactly the same thing with dog number two. I would let the other dogs watch you training. We call that modeling. 
Modeling is where the one dog watches another dog perform a behavior and they follow that, they model that behavior, right? We do it all the time, every day we have 15, 20 dogs watching other dogs in training while we're rotating our dogs through trainers. The third thing I would do is that would then, so you're obviously gonna do that with one dog, two dogs, first dog, then the second dog, then the third dog, each individually at one at a time. Then I would start working them two at a time and then it's up to you to decide which two. Obviously I don't know the dogs well enough, so I can't advise this. And you did mention that they would show aggression towards each other. That aggression could be a real aggression or it could be that they've just learned how to take over the household. Um, I don't know your home environment, but if it's an environment where the dogs are basically just running around doing whatever they want, then that makes it a much more difficult environment for you all of a sudden to establish control, especially if your dogs are two and three years of age. So it kind of just is a, is a short thing. If it's more complex than that, and, and I'm not sure if you're in Phoenix or not, you may have to uh, come and work with one of our trainers and get a little more detail and for us to know some more of the specifics or whatever. Um, I also noticed you mentioned mowing the lawn and a bird and those things. All of those things are just triggers. We call those triggers. It doesn't matter what it is, you're going to control the dogs one at a time regardless of the trigger out there. If you remember back to the beginning of this discussion when I was talking about Jesse and Chris's dogs and I talked about controlling their drive using leash work training, using obedience training, you're going to do exactly the same thing except in your case you're focusing on things on the outside all right and that's it for tonight guys again we'll see you next uh, wednesday at 6 p.m right now it is pacific standard time uh, and then that'll probably be our last episode for a season maybe we'll do an episode on europe yeah, we'll try. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool. cool. I'm starting to get into we'll have this. To, um, Christopher <laughs> kicked me. It only took 16 episodes. Christopher brought me kicking and screaming into this thing, but I'm starting to get a feel for it now. And I and I really love working with with you guys and and sharing the knowledge and so on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, so we'll see you guys next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Thank you very much. We'll probably do one last episode of frequently asked questions because we do still have a few that we'd like to cover, and uh, that is going to be it. Thanks very much, guys.